Welcome everyone to my second XCOM 2 War of the Chosen challenge run. You can check out my first run where I used only sparks on my YouTube channel, but today I'm going to be answering the question, can you beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only Templars in combat? Now Templars are an interesting class for a couple of reasons. One is that their primary attack is Rend, which is a melee attack, and secondly is that they have a unique mechanic called Focus. For each enemy they defeat with Rend, they acquire one point of focus. Other methods for collecting focus do become available later in the game. They can gain a maximum of two focus initially, though this can be increased to three later. And having focus increases the strength of Rend, and many of the Templar's psionic abilities cost focus to use. Before we begin, I do live stream these challenge runs on my Twitch channel, so if you're interested in seeing the entire playthrough of any of these videos, please give me a follow on Twitch, the link is in the description. And with that out of the way, let's check out the rules for this run. 1. We're playing on Commander Difficulty. 2. Uh, we're playing on Honest Man, which means we can only reload a previous save in the event of misclicks or glitches, not because the turn just didn't go the way that we wanted. And thirdly, and most obviously, we can only use Templars in combat. I will say now that this is actually my second attempt at this challenge. The first time through, I broke my Honest Man rule a couple of times and reloaded saves, so I decided just to start over and stick to that rule more rigidly the second time around. My general prediction for this campaign is that it's going to be pretty tough, and this prediction is based on my first attempt at the challenge. As the campaign progresses and we get more abilities, things should get a bit easier. We will have to deal with a few limitations though. One is that Templars don't really have a way of disabling powerful enemies. They do have Void Conduit which can trap enemies, but this only works on humanoid targets, and many of the most powerful enemies like Sectopods and Gatekeepers aren't humanoid, so it's not going to help us. Another issue is the lack of ability to shred. Those late game enemies also have a lot of armor, and grenades will be pretty much our only way to shred that armor. The good news is that unlike our spark run, we can use items in this run. Templars can only carry a single item each, but it's a lot better than nothing. So mimic beacons are going to be essential in the late game to distract those powerful enemies away from our soldiers. So beginning the run, I placed the regular 12 starting soldiers with 12 Templars. The main problem is going to be that our only method for replacing Templars is to recruit them via covert operations, and those covert ops aren't guaranteed to appear. So if we lose any troops, that's going to be a problem. And if a mission goes badly and we take a few injuries, we have no way of replacing our Templars. So that's going to be bad as well. Now the first mission which you're currently looking at, I actually played several times in playtesting. It was actually much harder than I thought to adjust my mods so the game would give me 12 Templars to start with. I did work it out, but I had to play the first mission about three to four times before I got there. The footage you're watching is the first attempt of the second campaign, but every attempt of this mission had the same issue, and it really highlighted how this run is going to go moving forward. See, you may think melee is bad because it involves getting very close to the enemy units, and you would be right, but possibly not for the reason you think. See, unlike our units, Advent Soldiers don't actually get an aim bonus based on proximity. So regardless of how close or far away you are, it won't affect their chance of hitting you. Other factors like being in cover still affect the hit chance, of course. But the biggest problem with charging in close to the enemy is that you risk moving too far forward and activating another pod. And on the four to five times I played this mission, only once did I not activate both pods at the same time. Most of the time, they simply spawn too close together. On the one time I didn't activate them at once, we mopped them up easily. See, our rend attacks are guaranteed to hit, which makes finishing advent soldiers easy enough, provided there isn't too many of them. But all the other times I activated both pods at once, and it really did come down to luck. I mean, you can do the maths, we've only got four attacks with our four soldiers, so if there are six advent soldiers active, we simply can't defeat them all quickly enough. Here we do get lucky and only activate one pot at a time, so dealing with the advent soldiers is very easy. I start research on alien biotech. Uh, normally I go for modular weapons, but our Templars can't use weapon attachments anyway, so there's not much point at this stage. I also start construction on the Guerrilla Tactics School, as there will be a few upgrades that we'll be interested in. 
I start scanning the rumor on the strategic layer, which will give us an engineer, which is going to be very useful this early in the game. And Alien Biotech actually completes before our next mission, so we begin the Advent Captain research. We hit the first Gorilla Rop, which will give us another engineer if we're successful, which will be very useful this early in the game. And this is a great example of the problem with Templars. We move in to hit the first pod and immediately activate the second, along with a few lost. I'm not too worried about the lost, but this shows how dangerous melee attacks are. Moving forward always risks a pod activation, and this is going to be an ongoing issue for this entire run. Thankfully, between the two pods, we only have three troopers and one sectoid. We take out all the troopers, and the sectoid raises a zombie instead of attacking. We then take out the sectoid on the next turn and clean up the lost without any real issues. The captain autopsy completes, and we undertake modular weapons purely because it's inspired and will only take a day. We then start on resistance communications, which is the thing that we really want. The next mission is a resistance op, and we have the horde sit rep, which means no advent, only lost. The lost could be a problem late in the campaign, as our auto pistols do so little damage, so it's going to be hard to make use of headshot. And the way headshot works, if you don't know, is that if you finish a lost with gunfire, you get your action refunded. For now, though, we're okay, as most of the lost we encounter only have 2-3 to three HP. We leave the down trooper behind, since we can't use them, as they're not a Templar and evac with a scientist without too much issue. We get a few promotions here, and I decide to give all my Templars parry. Uh, the way parry works is that if your Templar uses rend, you can activate parry instead of moving after your attack. This will guarantee the next attack misses the Templar, or at least that's what it's supposed to do. <laughs> we begin construction on the resistance ring, since we can use covert ops on this campaign, which is nice. Resistance comms finishes here, and we immediately start making contact with the Black Site region. I do want to start on plated armor research, as that will allow us to improve both our armor, giving us more health, and our gauntlets, which will mean we'll do more melee damage. Unfortunately, we don't have enough alloys, so we start work on the alien ruler weapons instead. The only one we'll be making use of is the frost bomb. It could be useful as it will be really the only way we have of disabling enemies we can't take out in one turn. We then get hit with our first retaliation mission, and the assassin shows up as our first chosen encounter. This isn't too bad, and I'm okay with any chosen except the warlock, because he's just brutal in the early game. We activate the first pod of a priest and a trooper, but we're just too far away to be able to attack them. We do move forward and end up activating a second pod of a trooper and a sectoid. We are able to take out the priest and one of the troopers, and the sectoid thankfully uses its turn to raise a zombie, while the trooper only goes on overwatch. At this point I'm pretty pleased, as we've avoided taking any damage, at least until the assassin gets her turn and hits one of our lowest level Templars, Petrova. She does survive, but she's dazed, and things went from seemingly pretty good to completely terrible, in a matter of seconds. So Petrova is thankfully still alive, but she's dazed, and the rest of the team is locked down because of the Overwatch. On top of that, we've got a zombie, and we've unveiled a faceless. So there's now five active enemies, and one of them is the Assassin. I took a minute to regain my composure at this point, as I often panic, react too quickly, and end up making bad moves. So I decide the first thing to do is take out the Sectoid, one of the Templars, Magister, has one focus from finishing the Trooper, so this means her Rend attack gains a bonus point of damage, and she's guaranteed to take out the Sectoid in one hit, which will also take out the Zombie along with it. The problem is, of course, she has to run the Overwatch in order to do that. The risk pays off as she avoids the Overwatch shot and takes down the Sectoid. I move Warden next to Petrova to remove her day status, but this puts him too far out of position to make any effective attacks. I then use another Templar, Carpenter, to take out the Trooper. The Faceless goes after Carpenter, but she does have parry active and avoids the attack. And then here something really bad happens. The Assassin uses Harbor Wave, which is an AoE attack that dazes any units in its path. The AoE is absolutely massive and hits both Carpenter and Magister, even though I thought I had them spaced out enough. I was clearly wrong. Worse than that, the Faceless is still alive, and now they are in its reach and vulnerable. We do get a little bit of good luck though, as the Assassin decides to end her turn by taking cover on a burning car. It immediately explodes at the start of our turn, and she loses 6 HP, no thanks to anything that I did. 
And I believe it was actually the missed Overwatch shot from the Trooper that set the car alight in the first place. So that's pretty awesome. The Trooper's legacy is blowing up a car on his commander and he'll never even know. So sad. So I begrudgingly accept I'm not going to be able to finish the Assassin and she'll get yet another turn as I need to prioritise my downed soldiers. So I basically start a daisy chain of recovery. I move Petrova up who still only has 1 HP and revive Magister. I then move Magister up to Ren the Faceless and this puts her right next to Carpenter and she's able to revive her. Carpenter then hits a rend of her own on the Faceless and the Faceless is down. During this time I also get one hit on the Assassin with Warden. This leaves him right next to her and she is still alive but he does have parry so I'm not too worried about it. The Assassin summons a trooper and then disappears. Warden quickly ends the trooper. Carpenter finally heals Petrova and then we go searching for the Assassin. She leaps from the shadows and attacks Warden with her blade, but he has parry active, so he's fine. She then moves a ridiculously long distance across the map, and we start pursuing with our Templars. We're thankfully able to finish her off easily before she can attack anyone else. And wow, what a mission. Things had been going very smoothly up until this point, but that was just brutal. Including the Assassin, we had three pods active at once. We did take an injury but managed to persevere all the same. The first retaliation mission is usually pretty bad, especially in War of the Chosen, so I'm not too worried at this stage, but maybe I should be. We then start a covert op to obtain yet another engineer. I also start work on the infirmary as we really can't afford to be having our Templars injured for too long. We still don't have the alloys required for plated armor, so I begin research on resistance radio instead. I also return to Templar HQ and scan there. This actually reduces the healing time for soldiers, and there aren't any scan rewards that I want at the moment, so it seemed like the best choice. The next Guerrilla Op is up next, and because we've made contact with two regions, we have a choice of which event we want to stop. And this is probably a good time to talk about Guerrilla Ops. See, Advent will deploy multiple dark events, normally three, and most of the time you'll only be able to stop one of them. This is why you want to make contact with exactly three regions by the third round of Guerrilla Ops. You're given one dark event to counter for each region you've made contact with, up to a maximum of three. So having three regions gives you the most amount of choices as to which event you want to counter, because some are definitely worse than others. However, on the third region you contact, you'll normally encounter the second chosen. And if you keep expanding past that, you could encounter the third chosen on top of that. So three regions is really nice in the early game. It gives you plenty of choice for guerrilla ops and also minimizes the amount of chosen that you'll have to deal with. As for this guerrilla op, one of the dark events is made whole, which removes all weaknesses from the chosen. This means our Templars won't be doing extra damage to the assassin, which would be absolutely horrific. So that's the one we take. And plus the reward for countering this dark event is a scientist, which will be really useful. So it's a no-brainer. And if I hadn't made contact with that second region by this point, I may not have been able to choose this mission. So really important to give yourselves those options in the early game. So we start the mission and activate a pod from stealth on our first turn with our first soldier. We're off to a great start. We are able to eliminate the sectoid, but the stun lancer survives. And I'm not entirely sure what happened here, but it was incredibly unfair and really frustrating. The Stun Lancer charges Carpenter for a melee attack, which I'm fine with, as she has parry and will be able to block it. But when the Stun Lancer reaches her, it catches on fire and gets the burning status. Now, burning prevents some units from melee attacks, including Stun Lancers. So instead of simply not being able to attack, the Stun Lancer gets its turn refunded and is able to run back to where it was and then shoot at me. So basically three actions in one turn. And as if that wasn't unfair enough, the melee attack still caused my parry to trigger, so Carpenter is now defenseless and takes four damage from the gunfire. So basically the Stun Lancer got to attack twice, and that's pretty garbage. One of my Templar's Warden seems pretty angered by the situation too, as he hits with a critical on our next turn and one-shots the Stun Lancer. We got no tolerance for cheaters in this run. However, as Warden launches this attack, we activate another pod of a captain and a trooper. We take out the captain and then use parry to protect ourselves from the trooper. Thankfully it works this time and we avoid taking any further damage. We clean up the final pod and hack the objective, giving mission success and a scientist as a reward. 
I start making contact with the third region and start researching magnetic weapons. We make contact with the third region and uncover the hunter, so I'm looking forward to meeting him. We then get our first supply raid mission, which goes off without a hitch, and we now have enough supplies to purchase squad size upgrade 1, giving us an extra soldier slot on missions. We also get tactical analysis as our continent bonus, and I'm feeling pretty confident at this point. We get a council mission to rescue a resistance operative, and this is our first mission in the hunter's domain, so I'm expecting him to show up. We get into a tight spot where we're sandwiched between two pods. I'm able to take one of them out and then use momentum to run out of line of sight of the second. And because of tactical analysis, the surviving pod all use their one turn on movement and can't actually attack us. Tactical analysis really saved us here, and we could have been in huge trouble without it. The hunter then arrives as I expected, and I then finish the purifier and stun lancer from the active pod. The sectoid does survive, but uses its turn to raise a zombie rather than attack us. We finish the sectoid on the next turn and then make contact with the VIP. The hunter is using tracking shot, but this is really just a minor annoyance while we have to protect the VIP from a few waves of advent reinforcements. We dispose of them without too much issue and then successfully evac without actually having to engage the hunter. We finally begin construction on the proving ground and get hit with another set of guerrilla ops. One of the dark events here is Alien Infiltrator, which places hidden faceless on missions. I actually always allow this dark event whenever I can. It does make things a bit more dangerous having faceless show up on missions, but it means you get access to faceless corpses which you can use to build mimic beacons. So my advice is to always let this dark event happen whenever you get it. We opt to stop the hidden event, mainly because the reward is a scientist, which should be useful. We deploy on the mission and start things off by activating two pods and two turrets. Excellent. We take out both pods minus one purifier, who we disable with a flashbang. The turrets don't actually shoot, I think because of tactical analysis but a third pod consisting of a sectoid and a trooper does come in at the same time. We finish off the purifier and the trooper, but the sectoid lives and actually takes a shot at one of our Templars, Jackal. We have parry to deflect the attack, but Roberti does take a hit from one of the turrets. To make matters worse, Advent signals reinforcements for the next turn. So we take out the sectoid and hack the objective on the last turn remaining, so we're still in with a chance, but things are not looking good at this point. We heal with Roberti and await the reinforcements. Two stun lancers and a priest drop out of the sky, and things seem to just keep getting worse for us. We take out one of the stun lancers and stun the second one, so it can't perform any actions on its next turn. Also, one of the train carriages blew up, taking out the turret that was on top of it. We also disorientate the priest with a rend attack, and we're finally getting some good luck on this mission. The priest and remaining turret both miss their attacks on the next turn, and then we clean them all up. A lot happened on this mission, but we walked away successful, and with only one injury, so it wasn't a bad effort. Next up is a retaliation mission with Advent now deploying Mutons. Now Mutons have an ability called Counter-Attack that may trigger when you attempt a melee attack on them. The Muton blocks the attack and then hits with a melee attack of their own. Now given melee attacks are our main form of offense, Mutons may be the most dangerous opponents we will come across in the campaign, since we just don't have an easy way to deal with them. So I use a flashbang on the first pod as disorienting the Muton stops it from being able to counterattack. I'm not able to eliminate the Muton, but thanks to tactical analysis it opts to find new cover instead of attacking. On the alien turn, a second muton activates, and things are looking less than fantastic right now. We take out the first muton and use a Templar with Fortress, Magister, to finish off the Purifier. Fortress on Templars is really great as it protects from explosions, so this way you don't have to worry about Purifiers blowing up in your face, quite literally, when you take them out with Rend. We creep forward to the Muton and the accompanying trooper, but they're too far away to use Rend, so I opt to hunker down instead. The Muton thankfully targets a civilian instead of our soldiers. Now, does that make me a horrible person for saying that? Our good luck continues as one of the resistance operatives shoots at the Muton and destroys its cover. I then finish the Muton using Vault, and we charge forward to finish the trooper. 
We then regroup and move towards the next cluster of advent pods. The civilians are hiding in a building, so we move right up to the doors on our turn and then open the door on the next. This places us close enough for melee attacks while giving us our full turn to hit advent. We end up activating three pods at once, but most of the advent forces have lost health from resistance gunfire. We're able to take out a mech and stun lancer, but we do unveil a faceless as we do so. Advent mostly goes after the civilians, with the faceless being the only one to target our soldiers, but we're thankfully able to block with parry. On our next turn, we eliminate the mech and the faceless, and the stun lancers choose to target civilians again. We then eliminate the stun lancers and achieve mission success. This was a tough slog of a mission, but we somehow made it through with zero injuries, and it's mainly because Advent were targeting the civilians instead of us. Plated armor research completes, which gives us access to Predator armor and Tempest gauntlets. This means we'll both have more health and our rend attacks will be doing an extra point of damage. We also complete the Muton autopsy and then begin researching plasma grenades in the Proving Ground, and we also build the Frost Bomb and the Skulljack. Another round of Guerrilla Ops is up next, and we send some lower level soldiers so they can gain some XP. We uncover a pot of sectoids, which are now a guaranteed one shot with our improved gauntlets. I get a bit overconfident and charge out to them on the first turn. This activates another pod in the process, containing a mech, a captain, and an elite trooper. Despite the captain trooper and one sectoid all surviving to their turn, we actually take no damage. We finish the sectoid, stun the trooper, and skulljack the captain. A codex spawns in which we frostbomb so it can't attack on its turn, and to prevent it from cloning. We clean up the remaining advent forces on the next turn, but we are running short on time to complete the objective. Thankfully this is a transmitter disposal mission, so we can increase the turn timer by destroying power relays. The final pod consists of a muton and two sectoids. We again flashbang the muton before attacking and then mop up the pod. We plant the X4 charges and then complete a flawless mission. At this point, I decide it's time to hit the black site mission and things immediately go sideways as we lose our concealment to a badly placed turret. This also causes the assassin to spawn in, so things just keep getting better as we then activate the first pod and we're out of melee range. On the next turn, we take out one of the troopers and the other one falls back to reinforcements. We pursue the trooper into a pod of a muton, mech, and another trooper, as well as encountering the assassin. The pod is thankfully out of range to attack, and tactical analysis means they can only move forward, not hurt us. The assassin attacks and dazes one of our soldiers named Volt. She then moves behind our lines to take cover. This actually turns out to be beneficial as we can move towards her and away from the other pod. We take her out with a few melee attacks and then prepare for the incoming onslaught. On Advent's turn, only the Muton makes it into attack range and thankfully it goes for a suppression. Even better, it takes cover on a car and now that we have plasma grenades, we can hit the Muton with the grenade and explode the car at the same time. The Muton is left with 1 HP and we easily finish it off with a pistol. I do get a bit worried here as I can't actually see where the mech went. My fears end up being justified as the mech has jumped onto the roof of the building we are on and appears to flank us on its turn. Thankfully it misses as it fired at Martin who had already lost health earlier in the mission. We hit the mech with multiple rends and finish it before going after the trooper and once the pod is dealt with we regroup and move forward. We enter the main building of the black site and take out the pod inside without issue. At this point, we are able to shoot at one of the explosive objects just outside the building. I can't actually see any enemies, but the fact we're given the option to shoot at the object means that there's an enemy unit in its blast radius. We take the shot and then set up an overwatch ambush. No enemies come for us, and I assume it was a turret that was near the explosive. A pod of a codex and two sectoids then come investigating the explosion, and we easily take them out. We grab the vial and evac without further issues. Our troops are a bit tired for the next supply run, and this is an ongoing issue. We only have limited troops and can't easily recruit more, so I decide to just take the five soldiers with the highest will. We encounter a pod of a mech, shield bearer, and stun lancer, and our lack of ability to shred is becoming a problem. We're not able to easily deal with armored units. What's worse is we trigger another pod of a spectre and two vipers. We're able to eliminate the stun lancer and freeze one of the vipers, 
Roberti gets shot by the Spectre, and then the Viper uses Rap on her. She's down to two health, and the Viper has a shield from the Shield Bearer. This is looking really grim. I hit the Shield Bearer with multiple rends, but it survives with one HP. With my last Templar, I hit the Viper, and we thankfully stun it. I then retreat with Roberti, as one more hit will take her out. The Spectre makes a copy of Jackal, the other Viper uses Bind on Carpenter, and we activate a third pod. And this is a complete disaster at this point. So I hit the Viper first to free Carpenter, and then focus on the Spectre to get our clone soldier back, and it takes three Rens to finish it. Once Jackal is back up, we finish one of the Vipers and prepare for the wave of agony that's about to crash upon us. The remaining Viper uses Bind on Martin, and the new pod has a shield bearer that gives Advent another shield. The other attacks are blocked by parry, and we then get our chance to hit back. We destroy everything except the shield bearer and the spectre that we can't locate. The spectre makes a clone of Roberti, and the shield bearer is easily parried. We finish off both the spectre and shield bearer on our next turn. Thankfully we didn't lose anyone, but three of our soldiers have suffered injuries. I scan at Templar HQ after the mission as we need our soldiers to heal as quickly as possible. We start building battlefield medicine in the proving ground to increase the potency of our medikits. I get a feeling we're going to need them. Up next we have a council mission to rescue a VIP and things go horribly immediately. There's a pod of a sectoid and a muton across a skinny walkway with little cover which we move into to attack. But right behind them is another pod of a Muton, Purifier, and Mech. We take out the original pod of the Sectoid and the Muton. I then move some of my troops around a corner and out of line of sight, relying on tactical analysis. The Muton hits one of our Templars, Ulrich. Then the Purifier throws an incendiary grenade into the group of soldiers around the corner that the AI doesn't even have line of sight on. This was incredibly cheap, and to make matters worse, the mech shoots at Ulrich and finishes him off. We have our first casualty of the campaign. Also, as if that wasn't bad enough, Ulrich was the one who had the frost bomb. We can't afford to carry his body out to the evac zone, so we've lost the frost bomb for the rest of the campaign. Just amazing. We finish off the purifier and the mech on our next turn, but the muton retreats to reinforcements. We follow the Muton and find it has fallen back to a pod of a Captain, Shield Bearer and Trooper. We disorientate all four enemies with one flashbang and then use Reaper on Pollock to take out the Captain and Muton. The Shield Bearer activates its ability while the Trooper goes on Overwatch. We also have a faceless move in on our position thanks to the Alien Infiltrator Dark Event. I'm kind of regretting what I said about that Dark Event earlier. We take out the Trooper on the next turn. The Shield Bearer and Faceless survive for one more turn before we take them out, but they don't cause us any harm. Another Faceless reveals itself and reinforcements are incoming, but we evac out safely with the VIP. And because we evac out, we don't get any corpses, which means these Faceless won't provide us the ability to build a Mimic Beacon. So yeah, it just keeps getting better and better. So this was the first mission of the campaign that went really badly. But thankfully there is some good news that we ranked up one of our soldiers to captain level. This allows us to buy squad size 2 so we can now field 6 Templars on the tactical layer and mentally awake which allows all Templars to start every mission with one focus. Both these abilities are going to come in very handy. Meanwhile we finally begin on completing the story research now that we've built the Shadow Chamber. We get our first ambush on a covert operation of this campaign, but our Templars power through it without any issues. This covert op allowed us to recruit another Templar, so we've at least replenished our ranks after losing Ulrich. Of course, we still don't have a frost bomb. We get another guerrilla op, and one of the dark events is the Collectors, which will see the Chosen always attempting to capture soldiers on missions. We really can't afford to lose any more troops, so we deploy... As a bonus, we have the Location Scout sit rep, which allows us to view all enemies on the field at all times. A pod of aliens and lost see each other and move towards each other, blowing our concealment in the process. We dispose of a Spectre, but we can't melee the Viper without activating another pod. We finish the Lost with pistol shots, and I spread out the troops so the Viper won't use its Poison Mist attack. The Viper retreats back to reinforcements, and the Assassin drops in. 
yeah, it's going to be one of those missions. I continue taking out Lost and continue spreading my soldiers out so we don't get hit by a harbor wave from the assassin. A faceless reveals and we activate another pod of a mech, priest and shield bearer. I take out the faceless and activate a few more Lost in the process. I'm actually not worried about the Lost as I'm hoping they'll give Advent something to shoot at other than us. Using momentum, I hide most of the soldiers up on a train so they're out of line of sight. My plan works and Advent focus on the Lost over our Templars. We take out the Lost that climb up to our position and then continue holding our ground. Advent keep going after the Lost and the mech even uses its rocket ability on a group of Lost. This is great news as it now can't use that ability on us. However, there is a problem that the Advent and Lost forces are fighting around the objective that we have to reach and the turn timer is counting down. I'm not happy about it, but I decide to drop down and join the fray. I activate Reaper with Lou and we chop down the mech and another couple are lost. We take out the Priest, but Sustain activates and it survives. The Priest uses Holy Warrior to buff the Shield Bearer and the Assassin comes for Jackal, but he thankfully counters with Parry. We take out the Priest, which also eliminates the Shield Bearer, thanks to Holy Warrior. The Advent Forces are now totally wiped out, and we hit the Assassin with as many attacks as we can. It's pretty crazy to see the damage we are outputting. One of the Rend attacks hits for 15 damage against the Assassin. The Assassin does hang on with 2 HP, and she summons a Stun Lancer on her turn. As she does this, we hit her with Bladestorm and take her out. We clean up the Stun Lancer and another Faceless before hacking our objective and calling it a day. Despite a bad start, this mission went really well. We continue the story research and start making contact with a region housing an Avatar facility, as the Avatar progress bar is one pip away from being full. However, our plans go on hold as we get hit with a retaliation mission. Berserkers deploy on this one, but we do at least have our first Mimic Beacon. Two pods activate at once, but they prioritise the civilians over us. There is a Muton accompanying the Berserker, but everyone starting with one bar of focus means we can easily take it out with Vault. We power through the remaining enemies and move up. We get up on the roof of the building the civilians are hiding in. There's so much clutter on the roof that we don't have as much mobility as I expected, and several of our Templars simply can't get into range to attack quickly enough. Thankfully, the aliens continue focusing on the civilians, and yeah, that still sounds like a terrible thing to say when I hear it back. So we end up activating every pod left on the field. I take out as much as I can and throw down the Mimic Beacon. I think I've done the best that I can, but a Muton throws a grenade into the civilians and takes out seven of them in one hit. Now, we haven't lost the mission just yet, but things are very tight. I use Reaper on Lou and take out a Berserker and then flashbang two Mutons at once. We mop up the Mutons now that they're defenseless and we're only left with one Berserker. Or at least so I think. A Faceless activates and there's actually another Muton that I had lost line of sight on. The Berserker and Muton both attack civilians and we're now at a point where if we lose one more civilian, we fail the mission. I flashbang all three enemies and then mop them up with Rend. Three of our soldiers have taken damage, but we've successfully defended the region. We then make contact with the region and I hit the facility. My plan is to ignore as many enemies as I can and just plant the X4 to destroy the facility and then bail. Also, Advent deploy Archons on this mission and their large health pools could make them a problem moving forward. The pod of an Archon, Mech and Stun Lancer is in our way to the facility, so I decide to engage. During our attack, we activate another pod of a Captain, Stun Lancer, and Purifier, as well as a turret. We're only able to finish the mech, and then we throw down the Mimic Beacon. The Archon appears to ignore tactical analysis here as it moves and shoots, and I have no idea why it was able to do this. Do Archons get three actions per turn? The Mimic Beacon gets destroyed, but thanks to Parry, we don't take any damage. Using Reaper, we clean up the Stun Lancer, Purifier, and Archon, and then avoid taking damage on the enemy turn again. We're finally able to finish off the captain and turret and can then focus on planting the explosives. We successfully plant them and evac out without ever encountering the remaining enemies. We have a rescue mission from the skirmishers up next and it turns out to be pretty interesting. 
See, the aliens and Lost activate each other, but we stay in concealment, letting them fight amongst themselves. Once the Lost are finished, the enemy AI kind of breaks, and all the Advent forces start clustering together in one spot. After a while, I decide to activate and hit four enemies at once with a grenade, and even more than that with a flashbang. Reaper allows us to clean up most of the Advent forces, but our explosions do draw in more Lost. We take out a lot of both factions of enemies and drop a Mimic Beacon for the couple of Mutons still alive. Another pod does activate, but another Mimic Beacon keeps them at bay. Between the Lost and Advent, there's just too many enemies to be able to take them all out, so I opt to use my final flashbang and then hope that Parry will keep us safe on the enemy turns. And I always forget that Shield Bearers can actually still use their ability even disoriented, so that's a bit annoying. And speaking of annoying, at this point another Lost Pod spawns right on the evac zone. And these Lost Pods are big by this point in the game. I send Jackal onto the front line as he has Bladestorm and should be able to keep the Lost at bay. He takes out a couple and Advent thankfully go after the Lost rather than us. It's been a rough slog but on the next turn we finally take out the remaining enemies and start heading for the evac zone. It was a gruelling mission but we actually made it through without injuries. Minus the VIP, but I'm not worried about that. Before too long, we have another Gorilla Op, and we choose to stop the Rapid Response Dark Event as it guarantees reinforcements on all Gorilla Ops missions. What's more, a Codex is on the mission, so we equip the Skulljack and decide it's time to have our first encounter with an Avatar. Spoiler warning, this turns out to be a monumental mistake. So things start going wrong when I'm down to one turn left to plant the X4, but no one can get close enough on a blue move. I decide to destroy one of the power relays, but this blows our concealment. As we buy ourselves one extra turn, the hunter spawns in. Even better, Advent drop a pod of reinforcements in on us too. We charge the hunter and take most of his health, and then the reinforcements of a priest, purifier, and shield bearer drop in. Even better, a pod of a spectre, purifier, and shield bearer then run into us and activate. The hunter takes a shot at us but misses and it's thankfully our turn again. We do take out the hunter but still have to use two mimic beacons as there's just too many advent. On the next turn, a third pod activates just to drive this point home. I go after one of the purifiers and disorientate him with rend. Purifiers can't use any of their abilities when disoriented, so we've effectively disabled it for the next turn. We continue the attack and take out both shield bearers and hit the priest for big damage. I'm hoping the sectoids will raid zombies, but one of them goes for a mind spin and causes Petrova to panic. Even worse, she shoots at the codex, causing it to clone, so now there's an extra enemy to deal with. Jalal then gets cloned by the spectre, knocking him out, and Pullet gets a stasis from the priest. So just like that, we've gone from 5 Templars to 2, and things are suddenly looking really bad. Not to mention the aliens now have an extra codex and a spectre clone, so their numbers have increased by 2. I take out both sectoids, which frees Petrova of her panic. I make a really risky play and send her after the clone of Jalal. The clone has 8 health, and Petrova is doing 7 to 8 damage, so we're depending on rolling an 8, Otherwise, we're in real trouble. Thankfully, we do, and the clone goes down, giving us access to Jalal again. If this had failed, on the next turn, Carpenter would have had three enemies on her flank, and I doubt she would have survived. We take out the priest with Jalal, but the stasis on Carpenter remains until the alien's turn. We only take a single hit with Roberti, which isn't nearly as bad as it could have been. I take out everything except one of the Codex clones and hit it with a flashbang. I want to keep it alive so I can Skulljack it next turn and bring in the Avatar. At this point, I've actually forgotten the Spectre is still out there. The Avatar spawns and we hit it once before it teleports onto the roof, which is terrible placement for us as no one is in melee range. We're still able to hit it with Vault and it teleports into Rend range. Unfortunately, it survives with 1 HP and I unveil the Spectre at the same time. The Avatar mind controls Pollock and no one else is close enough to attack it. What's worse is it recovers HP every turn, so the longer it remains out of our line of sight, the harder it's going to be to beat. The Spectre then clones Jalal again and we're now down to 3 Templars. The Avatar hits Roberti with a Null Lance and she doesn't survive. We're now down to 2. 
We thankfully get lucky with our damage rolls and are able to finish the Spectre with just Gerard and Carpenter. This frees Jalal who goes up to the roof for cover. The Avatar now mind controls Carpenter, but this releases Pollock, so we're no worse off. We finally get back to attacking the Avatar, but it survives with 2 HP. I think I'm safe as everyone has activated parry, but it turns out parry doesn't actually block against Null Lance. So there's a fun fact for you, and Jalar loses half his health. Not so fun for him. On the next turn, we're finally able to finish the Avatar off and we win the mission. But wow, did that go terribly. Losing another Templar is a big hit that I'm not sure we can afford to take. We have a supply raid and Jackal takes an injury but nothing too major to be worried about. We then have another council mission to neutralise an enemy target and this one goes majorly wrong. And I'm starting to detect a pattern here. We move in to attack the first pod of a mech codex and shield bearer. In the process we activate another pod of three codexes and two turrets. Now the mech is a problem because of its armour and our shredding options are limited to grenades. And the codexes are a problem because if we can't one shot or disorientate them, they'll clone. I'm able to take out the shield bearer and then throw down our only mimic beacon as the other one is on a covert op. The first codex and mech destroy the mimic beacon and the remaining codexes mostly just go in overwatch with only one using a psionic bomb. Initially I'm thankful for this, but that changes after I realise someone is going to have to run two overwatches. We take out a few of the codexes, but Red Devil does get hit by an overwatch. But thanks to the codexes cloning, when they take damage, despite taking down three of them, we end the turn with only one less than what we started with. On the alien's turn, I'm hoping we'll get at least one psionic bomb, but all the codexes choose to shoot instead. Beast takes a hit, and Gerard takes multiple hits. We would have actually lost her, but she thankfully had sustain which activated, so she hangs on with one HP. Obviously we need to be careful with her for the rest of the mission. Just for full transparency, I actually reloaded the turn here. I had activated Reaper with Red Devil and she took out two codexes and we then threw a grenade at one of the turrets. Despite the game telling me the grenade would hit the turret, it didn't, so I reloaded. I repeat the Reaper attacks on the codexes, but then opt to move Gerard in closer to the turret to use a grenade instead. And I bet you can guess what happens here. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Yes, that's right, we activate another pod. Gerard is way too vulnerable at this point, so I abandon using the grenade and instead move her out of line of sight of the enemies. Thankfully the pod has moved into a building, so moving the rest of the team also out of line of sight isn't too difficult. We're then relying on tactical analysis to keep the pod at bay until our next turn. So on our turn, we open the door to the building and Red Devil finds herself basically face to face with a heavy mech. I send multiple Templars in to weaken the Advent Soldiers, but can't finish any of them off. We also eliminate the VIP with Green. He was out of rend range on the enemy soldiers, so this was a way to move him up and still be able to activate parry. We do lose an intel reward for capturing the VIP alive, but right now keeping our troops alive is more important. A priest moves in and mind controls Pollock, which I actually prefer over shooting as it doesn't waste a parry. The mech uses its missiles, but everyone in the blast range uses parry, even Pollock who is mind controlled. The advent trooper then shoots at the beast and takes him out. This is now the third Templar we've lost, and I'm starting to think this campaign may be done. Even better, advent signal for reinforcements. I probably would have evac at this point, but this mission has a set evac zone, so we can't even do that. I take out the mech, and we deal enough damage on the priest to send it into stasis. Stasis actually causes the mind control to end, which I didn't realise, so we have Pullock back on our side. On the alien turn, the reinforcements drop in, a trooper, a shield bearer, and a purifier. What's more, the priest places Petrova into stasis. I'm able to take out the shield bearer and the priest, and thanks to parry, we don't take any damage on the enemy turn. We mop up the trooper and the purifier, and then start heading for the evac zone. We book it out of there, and honestly, this may be the worst mission yet. And like I said, at this point I'm considering just giving up on the campaign. We're losing Templars way too fast and we just can't seem to keep up with Advent's forces. 
There is some good news as we finally have our first major, which means we can continue hunting the Chosen in Covert Ops. Not that we can really spare anyone for a Covert Op right now. But the good news is short-lived as the Advent Force level grows high enough to deploy Andromedons on the next mission. Thankfully we don't lose anyone, but Petrova and Duster are wounded, and Duster is actually shaken too. We do get a couple more mages, and I opt to give all of them Arcwave, which turns Rend into an AoE attack. It's a really good ability, and may help give us some much needed firepower. Pollock also reaches Colonel almost straight away, thanks to the Covert Op reward being a promotion. I give her both Ghost, which allows her to make a clone of herself, and Ionic Storm, which gives her an AoE attack, which is really devastating on three bars of focus. However, an even bigger game changer comes as we finish Powered Armor Research. This allows us to build Warden Armor, which will give us more HP, and Celestial Gauntlets, which will give Rend an extra point of damage. The next couple of missions go really well with our new buffed gear, and thanks to another Retaliation mission, we're able to build a third Mimic Beacon. Just when everything seemed hopeless, we may have turned the tables. I decide to hit the Forge mission at this point as we are running behind on story research. The first pod we encounter is an Andromedon and a Spectre, and we rip through them without any trouble, but the Hunter does spawn in as we've now lost our concealment. The Andromedon shell actually does get to attack us with its punch. We parry the attack and the punch blows up the truck the Andromedon is standing next to, so it only damages itself. I was pretty happy with this outcome, not gonna lie. We push forward slowly, avoiding the hunter's tracking shot and taking out a turret as we go. The turret takes a lot of attacks to destroy since it has so much armor, but without any active pods, we're never in any danger. We then encounter a heavy mech and a priest. We move forward to attack and this causes the sector pod that always spawns on this mission to activate. We've got multiple mimic beacons, so I'm not too worried about it. We take out the mech and the priest goes into stasis. We toss out a mimic beacon and the priest and sector pod target it, sparing our soldiers. On the next turn, we shred the sector pod with a grenade and take out the priest. We then focus all our rend attacks on the sector pod and finish it with Pollock, as she has fortress, so takes no damage when it explodes. We push further ahead into the forge facility and quickly encounter a mech, stun lancer and trooper. Arcwave is really making a difference here as we're able to hit multiple enemies at once. We take the pot out without any real issues and keep pressing on. And I'm trying to give all the Templars a chance at finishing enemy soldiers so they can all fill up their focus bars. The fact I even have this luxury is proof to me that we've turned things around on the tactical layer. A few missions ago it was all we could do to survive, but now we've got options and can pick our spots because we're dominating so much. It's really crazy how much that new gear and having a few mages has turned the tide in this campaign. We encounter a pod of an Archon and two Codexes, but with two Mimic Beacons still at our disposal I'm not worried. We flashbang the whole pod and are then free to attack the Codexes without fear of clones. Lou crushes the pod with Reaper and we don't even end up needing a Mimic Beacon. The Hunter then comes in for the attack and throws a stun grenade but we parry it away. We then hammer him with Rens and take him out like it was nothing. I know I keep harping on about this but it's truly incredible how much things have changed in such a short space. We grab the body and make a beeline to the evac zone. Some mechs and a priest get dropped in as reinforcements behind us, so I toss a mimic beacon to slow them down. We then evac out, and the forge mission has been a huge success. We get another set of guerrilla ops, and there's a couple of pretty bad dark events. I decide to stop Dark Tower, which creates greater will loss in our troops on every mission. This would be devastating, as our limited number of soldiers is the most difficult part of this run. I only take 5 soldiers on this one as I think they can handle it and most of our roster has depleted will already. Turns out I'm totally wrong as Advent are now deploying sector pods on regular missions. And the problem with sector pods is their huge amount of armor and our lack of ability to shred it. It's a protected device mission and we're just not able to take out the enemies quickly enough so they destroy it. We fail at stopping the dark event which causes it to trigger immediately after the mission is over. We also take a few injuries, but thankfully everyone survives. The main issue now is we're running into mechs fairly regularly, and they can enter Overwatch upon being revealed. The best counters to this are Shadow Step and Lightning Hands, so I plan to invest in those abilities on some of our soldiers. We've also got a UFO hunting us, so I start to be a bit picky with what missions we deploy on, even skipping one and losing contact with the relevant region. 
Of course, the UFO finds us when two of our highest ranked soldiers are away on a covert op. Our time at the top was short-lived and we've been put on the backpedal once again. Now, truth be told, Templars are really good at the base defense mission in this game. They can move forward really far and attack at the same time. The trade-off obviously being that doing so can trigger more pod activations, which does happen. But something to be aware of in this mission is that the AI will often ignore your troops and make a beeline for the Avenger, as they win if they finish their turn there. This makes the mission even easier, and even though there's a lot of Advent to deal with, we're never in any real danger. Advent are deploying gatekeepers now, but things continue on without too much issue all the same. The Avatar progress does fill, so we're forced to do the Psionic Gate mission to lower it, despite most of the roster having depleted will. I bring a single medikit in case anyone gets chrysalid poisoned. I would have liked to bring more, but Templars can only carry a single item each, and mimic beacons and grenades are just too useful to ignore. And the Templars who have Fortress will be immune to poison anyway. We slowly work our way to the Gatekeeper. The Warlock zombies do slow us down significantly though, but they also give us more enemies to take out, which means more focus to generate. By the time we get to the Gatekeeper, Almost everyone on the team has three bars of focus. We hit the gatekeeper with Vault, as that ignores armor, and it only takes three attacks to finish it. The chrysalids hiding underground are honestly more dangerous. As soon as the gatekeeper is gone, the warlock reveals himself and hits Mind Scorch to daze three of our soldiers. Note to self, don't stand half the squad right next to each other when the warlock is about. His weakness is brittle, meaning he takes extra damage from close range attacks, this includes Rend. We do huge damage, but because half the team is incapacitated, he does survive. Thankfully, he only uses Mind Control, which he's not going to be around long enough to take any advantage of. He does have the ability that lets him enter Overwatch at the end of his turn, but it's easily removed with a Vault. We then Rend him right back to the Elders. The rest of the mission is simple enough, just cleaning up the remaining Chrysalid, but it takes an absolute age. I think the last one must have glitched out because it ran right back to the start of the map and it took quite a long time to locate. But after the world's dullest game of hide and seek, we clean up the last lid and we return home. We continue on before I decide to attack the hunter's base as he is close to reaching a high enough level to launch the Avenger assault mission, which we don't want. The first pod we meet is an Andromedon and three Mutons. Pretty terrible start, as Mutons are one of the most annoying enemies for Templars to deal with because of their counter-attack ability. I use the flashbang and am able to hit all but one of the Mutons. I then take out the two disoriented ones. In a moment of tactical brilliance, I forget to activate Reaper on Lou, so I have to use a Mimic Beacon to cover us. First pod isn't even dealt with yet, and we've already used two of our six utility items. Not the best start, but it's also a pretty horrific pod for Templars to deal with, so not much we can do about it. On the next turn, we finish the Andromedon without issue. I end up using a couple of vaults to finish the last Muton, which isn't ideal, as I'm trying to max out our focus before we encounter the Hunter. But once again, there's not much we can do about it. We continue on, and I realise here that kills with Bladestorm don't generate focus. From a gameplay perspective, this makes sense, as it is a different ability, but from a narrative perspective, this is pretty ridiculous. They're literally using the same gauntlets as they do with Rend. We carve our way to the Hunter's Chamber, and by the time we get there, only one Templar doesn't have full focus. This is great, since the Hunter has actually gained the ability of being immune to melee attacks. This is by far the worst ability he could have. Blasting him with high-powered vaults is going to be, by far, our best option. Otherwise, it's going to come down to pistols. When he spawns in, I start by shredding with a grenade. Martin, with her use of lightning hands and quick draw, can actually fire her pistol three times at the hunter. I did give her a perception PCS to boost her aim. That still doesn't stop her missing one of the 88% shots, and the hunter gets to fire back on missed shots. Luckily, he misses too. Ah, XCOM, the land of the blind. And it's here I realise Vault doesn't actually do that much more damage than the pistols. Vault actually does increase damage to psionic enemies, which is why the gatekeeper was hit so hard. But despite having obvious psionic abilities like teleporting, the hunter apparently doesn't count as a psionic enemy. We simply can't inflict enough damage on the hunter and he survives to hit back. He calls in three troopers as reinforcements, which normally would be bad, but here it's an opportunity to farm back our lost focus from Vault. So there is a plus side. 
He also shoots at Pollock for quite a bit of damage, which is obviously less good. Thanks to Reaper, we take out all the troopers and the hunter on our next turn, gaining some focus in the process. And here the next problem presents itself. We're having to shoot the sarcophagus with pistols for 3 to 6 damage apiece. Yeah, this is going to take a while. Did I mention an Andromedon, Chrysalid, Spectre and Heavy Mech spawn in over the next two turns as well? Needless to say, we can't destroy the sarcophagus in time and the hunter returns. His armor actually regenerates, which I didn't realize. This is going to be a tight battle. We're able to take out the regular enemies and I generate a ghost to hopefully serve as a meat shield and bait the hunter's attacks. It does cost focus to generate, of course. The plan doesn't work as he summons more troopers and then proceeds to totally ignore the ghost. He instead throws a stun grenade into a group of three Templars. Luckily they all have parry which actually blocks his grenades so this is an even better result. However we've got two Templars and a ghost fighting the troopers on one side of the map and four Templars dealing with the hunter on the other side. We're only able to take out two of the troopers, leaving the third one and the hunter to hit back. The surviving trooper similarly ignores the ghost in order to prioritize shooting at an actual human. Lou takes a rifle shot from the hunter and is bleeding, but we're able to heal her with the single medikit we brought. We go back to shooting the sarcophagus, but the pistol rolls are quite bad and we're just not doing enough damage. We use the ghost's final bit of focus to help finish the trooper, causing it to disappear. More enemies keep dropping in, but thankfully no Andromedons this time. We're able to destroy the sarcophagus at 75% charge, meaning the hunter spawns in one final time with 75 HP, 30 out of a maximum of 40. Most of the Templars can't get line of sight on the hunter to shoot, so I end up just charging in as close as possible. With some of them I actually attack him with Rend. It doesn't do any damage, but we can still parry afterwards, meaning we can close the distance between us and him safely. This works well as we once again bait the grenade and parry it. He does summon in yet more troopers, but we completely ignore them as we only have to beat the hunter to win the mission, not the other enemy units. I unleash a maximum power Vault Storm on him for huge damage. That combined with a few Vault Shots is too much, and we've finally taken the hunter out for good. By this point we've completed all the research we need, including the story research, and can actually hit the final mission whenever we like. I hold off though since we want to take out the other two chosen before we do that, lest they show up to wreck us like in the spark run. Taking out the warlock and assassin should be easier since they won't be immune to melee attacks. So once we've got enough healthy soldiers, we launch our attack on the assassin's stronghold, she takes extra damage from Templars, so I'm expecting this one to go reasonably well. Of course, I should know better than that by this point, as we start the mission by activating two pods on the same turn, and one of them has an Andromedon. Even better, we throw a Mimic Beacon and the Heavy Mech totally ignores it, bombing us with missiles instead. I think what happened is it could hit the Mimic Beacon plus other soldiers with the missiles, so it went for that attack. I've never seen that before, as normally units always use a standard attack on the Mimic Beacon, but it's my best guess as to what happened. Either that, or we just got glitched. We hit back on the next turn, but the units we're fighting just have too much health, and most of them survive. I end up using another two Mimic Beacons, which is all of them for the whole mission. On the third turn of engagement with these pods, we're finally able to eliminate the last of the enemies. I'm a lot less confident about the rest of this mission now. Despite getting a bit lost, the rest of the initial assault goes well and we actually reach the elevator with everyone having full focus. When the assassin does show up, the main problem is she has Planewalker so she can easily teleport out of our reach after each attack she sustains. This combined with Vanishing Wind, letting her enter concealment, substantially slows our progress. We are still able to take her down without too much trouble, it just takes a little while. Once she warps out, we're met with the same problem we had with the Hunter. Our pistols are doing such low amounts of damage on the sarcophagus. Our damage rolls do seem to be a bit higher on average this time, which is nice, and none of the reinforcements that drop in are too dangerous for us. The sarcophagus regenerates before we can destroy it, so we've got another round with the assassin. However, we take her out quite easily and continue shooting at the sarcophagus with our pistols. We're finally able to destroy it, and the assassin returns for the final time with only 50% health. We crush her pretty dominantly, and then there was one. 
The Avatar project is creeping up on us while we wait to hit the Warlock, so I reluctantly decide to sabotage a few Advent facilities, but not any of the ones housing alien rulers. Our Templars can't use any of the ruler gear, so there's really no point engaging them if we don't have to. All sabotage missions go off without too much issue, apart from this terrifying new enemy we encounter. The dreaded gatekeeper with legs. Okay, so it's just a glitch with a sectoid, but I thought it was pretty funny. Before too long, we're ready to hit the Warlock. The first section of the level is basically a slaughter, with our Templars slicing through everything in their path. We can deploy a whole team of colonels by this point, so we're pretty OP. And again, by the time we arrive at the final chamber, nearly the whole team has maximum focus, so our rend attacks are doing great damage. The Warlock has quite a few abilities, but one of his weaknesses is Brittle, meaning he takes extra damage from close range attacks. So yeah, you can probably guess how this one is going to go. As with the other Chosen, the main issue is the small amounts of damage we inflict on the Sarcophagus and the reinforcements that drop in. The Warlock himself isn't too much of an issue. After the Sarcophagus is destroyed, the Warlock warps in with 75% health, we dice him into sandwich-sized slices and celebrate our new Chosen Free World. It's then simply a matter of hitting the final two missions. I should say that by this point, we've run out of useful research. We still keep researching non-useful things, as every time you complete some research, there's a chance of getting a breakthrough. Breakthroughs are special research opportunities that you either need to take or miss out on for good. Some of them are kind of bad, but others can be great, like your weapons doing extra damage. So always be researching, even if nothing seems like it will be useful. You want to maximise your chances of getting those breakthroughs. Now before the final missions, I decide to make contact with another couple of regions to get the Mental Fortitude ability. This will mean if our soldiers panic, get stunned, etc., the effects will only last a single turn instead of two. I'm not expecting we'll need it, but it's an extra buff, and it might come in handy. The time it takes us to do this triggers the Avatar Project final countdown. It's pretty stressful, but it makes for a good climax. Either we win the final assault, or we lose, and the Avatar Project activates, and the world is doomed. Let's do it. We send Martin, Gerard, and Red Devil for the Network Tower, and I have a totally separate team ready for the final assault. I like taking two different teams for these missions. I imagine as soon as the network is hacked, the main team is on standby to jump through the portal on the Avenger and hit the aliens hard. I know this isn't actually the case as you see the Sky Ranger fly back to the Avenger at the end of the tower mission, but it's my head cannon and I think it's cool. There's not too much to say about the tower mission. We get quite a few enemies with high HP, so we're not able to take them out quickly. Thankfully, we've got a couple of Mimic Beacons and Parry, so our soldiers remain pretty safe. Notably, one of the Archons hits one of the other Archons with Blazing Pinions as some collateral damage. We manage to avoid the Blazing Pinions completely. What an epic fail. So then it's time for the final mission. All or nothing, here we go. So same deal as the Spark Run, we're not allowed to use the Commander's Avatar in combat. It can only move, never attack. And we also keep it off the front line so it doesn't absorb any fire from the enemies. As a random aside, did you know the Commander's Avatar can't use the Hunker Down ability? There's no fear here, I guess. Anyway, our misfortunes finally return as the very first pod consists of four Mutons. Mutons are one of the worst enemies for us to deal with. However, counterattack can be disabled by disorienting the mutons with a flashbang, so that's exactly what we do. So glad I decided to bring one of those. Without having to worry about counterattack, we run in and cut the whole pod into bits. However, in the process, we activate another pod with a sector pod. I debate between using a mimic beacon or just falling back. I decide to use one of the mimic beacons. Sector pods have three action points. So even with tactical analysis, it can still move and shoot. I'm really not thrilled about burning through a Mimic Beacon so early in the mission, but it beats getting shot by a Sector Pod, so we'll just have to roll with it. The Mimic Beacon absorbs all the enemy fire, and I then hit back with an Ionic Storm. I think this ability ignores armor, as it does big damage to the Sector Pod. I keep hitting the Sector Pod with Rens, and we're thankfully able to take it out on this turn. I do miscalculate the blast radius, and Lou takes some damage for it. This is actually a mistake I make all the time, and I get really annoyed at myself for it. 
Thankfully, I bought a second medikit, so we quickly get Lou back to full health and continue on. The next pod consists entirely of stun lances. As the pod activates, I get a glimpse of a second pod featuring an Andromedon. I decide against rushing out to attack the stun lances, as I know I will activate the other pod. Instead, I fall back, relying on tactical analysis to force the stun lances to move forward. I also activate a ghost as a meat shield, or a psionic shield, uh, just in case any of the stun lances do somehow get to attack. The stun lances run right into our trap, and on the next turn, we charge forward and rip them to shreds. So I then have no choice but to move forward, knowing what is waiting for us. But it turns out I actually made a mistake. It wasn't an Andromedon in the pod. It was two Andromedons, and four Mutons on top of that. Pretty much as bad as a pod as we can get. And did I mention earlier that we used up our only flashbang, so we now have no way of disabling counterattack? Well, we did. And now we don't. Great. I repeat the tactical analysis trick and fall back, but I'm pretty hesitant about it. As we learned with Arnie last time, Andromedons may sometimes attack you with their acid bomb even when they don't have line of sight. Thankfully, the enemies all use their single action point in advancing forward. Thankfully, Ryder has full focus. So we hit the entire pod with Ionic Storm. Ionic Storm and three focus bars is absolutely insane. Just have a look for yourself. Oh, what about him? Yeah, that's looking more like it, isn't it? That's looking... He can hit the whole pod. Well, that's what we want. That's what we want. Just get them all, man. Oh, no, there's another one there. I think I missed that one. No, no, I got him. Okay. <laughs> well, that, um... That simplified things a bit, didn't it? My goodness. Whoa. Okay, so Ionic Storm is beast. When you've got three focus. So yeah, we one-shot every single Muton and leave the Andromedons on pretty low HP. To think I was worried about this pod a minute ago. We finally make use of Invert and switch places with one of the Andromedons, placing it deep within our territory. We finish it off, but the other Andromedon does survive. We leave Petrova standing right next to it, and she immediately ends the robotic nightmare with Bladestorm as soon as it tries to attack. Not today, Andromedon. Again, we regroup in preparation for the next pod. Before long, we encounter an Archon accompanied by some Mutons, and I'm starting to get annoyed at the amount of Mutons on this mission. In any other scenario, they wouldn't bother me, but our Templars are ill-equipped to deal with them. Anyway, the Mutons are the least of our troubles, as we activate two Codexes and two Gatekeepers at the same time. Oh, and we activate four Stun Lancers too. This could end very, very badly. So we're looking at about 10 enemies, two of them being gatekeepers, and this is obviously not a great situation. I start off by getting on the roof just to scout the area, and then hitting one gatekeeper and codex with a vault. They're both psionic enemies, so it deals increased damage. However, then the real fun begins. And by fun, I mean the Reaper ability. It allows us to cut down a few of the stun lances pretty quick smart. I then send Lou in for an Ionic Storm, and it seems to do increased damage to gatekeepers. One goes down, and the other is left with a sliver of health. I then hit the Mutons with another Ionic Storm, and take them both out instantly. I've been sleeping on this ability for way too long. Carpenter and Ryder take out the Archon, while Duster misses with Lightning Hands, and then throws down a Mimic Beacon. Unfortunately, the Stun Lancer still gets to attack Lou, and hits her with a flanking critical hit. Lou is not having a good time on this mission. She quickly gets her revenge by taking out the Stun Lancer. We then easily mop up the remaining Gatekeeper and Codexes, and now it's time for the final chamber. We activate the Avatar, and after the first attack, it teleports out of melee range. This was always going to be the problem with these things, but we're able to hit it with a Vault. It teleports again, and we continue rending it until it's down. One of the Archons does survive, and it goes for Blazing Pinions, this is kind of annoying since we can't rend it while it's up in the air. Meanwhile, six Vipers teleport in as reinforcements. Also, the ghost we made doesn't accompany us into the final chamber. 
I kind of expected that, but it still kind of sucks. In response, I use the Avatar's corpse to create a new ghost. I then focus on the Vipers on the right side of the map, since the others are out of our reach. Good news is they are a one-shot with full focus, so they don't last long. The second Avatar appears, surrounded by two Spectres and two Mutons. Ouch. I use Reaper for crowd control on the remaining Vipers, or maybe crowd dispersal. Dispersal to the grave, of course. We also set up the Archon to be taken out with Bladestorm on the next turn. The Avatar is in the opposite corner of the chamber, so I can't even get line of sight on it. Thankfully, it uses both its action points sprinting to our position and doesn't get to attack. We also have three Codexes spawn in, which is just great. A focus on the Avatar, hitting it with rend after rend, our lack of shredding ability is again proving to be a bit annoying. It once again teleports out of melee range, but we finish it with Vault. I then send the Ghost in to unleash an Ionic Storm on the Mutons. The Ghost is destroyed in the process, as it vanishes once it runs out of focus, but the Mutons get taken down too, so it all works out. I throw the last remaining Mimic Beacon to keep the Codexes and Spectres off our tails. The final Avatar appears, and it has a retinue of two Sectoids and two Andromedons. Another pot of Vipers also spawns in. It's time to go all out. I hit a rend and then throw two Ionic Storms at the Avatar. Yep, that's about as all out as you can get. And there you have it. It is indeed possible to beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only Templars. This was a weird run. It was touch and go in the mid game and I really didn't think we were going to make it at one stage. Then as we gained powered armor, celestial gauntlets and got a few soldiers with Arcwave and Reaper, the tide started turning really quickly. And by the end of the campaign, it was complete domination and nothing could stand against us. I think the hardest thing about this challenge was not being able to easily replace the Templars when they were wounded or taken out. And that same difficulty is going to present itself in the next XCOM challenge run, Reapers only. I'm not sure when I'll have that video out, I've already done the run on my Twitch channel quite a while ago, but putting these videos together takes time. I'll try to be quicker than it took me to make this video. If you want to see more of my XCOM gameplay, your best bet is to follow me over on Twitch where I live stream all of my gameplay. The link is in the description. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. Thanks so much for watching, and take it easy.